thanks to everyone. And before the fun begins, I thought the greatest honor we could do for our speaker would be to have the president of Amherst College's student body give the introduction. And so I'm delighted to introduce Tanya Diaz, who's a senior at Amherst College. Hold your applause. <laughs> president of student body, a senior a major in black studies, working on her thesis, probably more or less as we speak. At <laughs> She's writing on Colonia and Golan diaspora, challenging national identity. Uh, she's done a phenomenal job, I think, as president of this student body, and I ask her to come forward and do the formal introduction. Thank you, Biddy. <laughs> Thank you, Biddy, for that introduction. Um, when Biddy told me that Rachel Maddow was going to be speaking at Amherst, I was really excited. I mean, she's really popular, really cool, really insightful, really articulate. It was a good thing. <laughs> and then when I was kindly invited to introduce this event tonight, um, I, I had to be a diligent Amherst student and Wikipedia her. <laughs> I'm sorry. But <laughs> reading all of Rachel Maddow's accomplishments she's achieved at such a young age <laughs> um, is pretty intimidating, but very impressive. And it is an honor to have her here tonight. <laughs> Rachel Maddow is host of the Emmy, Emmy Award winning The Rachel Maddow Show on MSNBC. The Rachel Maddow Show features Maddow's take on the biggest stories of the day, political and otherwise, including lively debate with guests from all sides of the issues, in-depth analysis, and stories no other shows in cable news will cover. Maddow received a bachelor's degree in public policy from Stanford University. She earned her doctorate in political science at Oxford University, which she attended as a Rhodes Scholar. Maddow first gained national prominence as a host on Air America Radio, where she worked from its inception in 2004. Prior to joining AAR, she worked for WRNX in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and, <laughs> and WRSI in Northampton, Massachusetts. <laughs> In January of 2008, Maddow was named an MSNBC political analyst, was a regular panelist on MSNBC's Race for the White House with David Gregory, and MSNBC's election coverage, as well as a frequent voice on Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In September 2008, The Rachel Maddow Show debuted as the most successful show launch in MSNBC history, and The Rachel Maddow Show was named one of the top shows of the decade, by the Washington Post in 2009. Maddow was also named a breakout star of 2008 by the Washington Post. Additionally, the, LL, the LA Times named her the best, tele, sorry, the best off television 2008, and she was named one of the top 10 political newcomers of 2008 by Politico.com. Maddow is the author of Drift, The Unmooring of American Military Power, a book on the role of the military in post-war American politics, which debuted at number one on the New York Times bestsellers list in March 2012. Meta was honored by the Interface Alliance with Walter Conkri Con Conkrite, Cronkite, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Faith and Freedom Award, and received the 2012 John Steinbeck Award from the Center for the Steinbeck Studies at San Jose University. She has received two Gracie Allen Awards, including Outstanding Host, News Nonfiction in 2012. The Rachel Maddow Show has been nominated twice by the Television Critiques Association for the Outstanding Achievement in News and Information category, and the show took home a GLAAD Award in 2010. She currently lives in New York City Massachusetts, and Massachusetts with her partner, artist Susan McCool. This is a very brief overview of <laughs> 
Rachel Maddow's career until now. If you would like a more detailed version, I urge you to Wikipedia her. <laughs> I'm kidding, she has a personal website. <laughs> but um, anyways, without further ado, I would like you to join me in warmly welcoming television host, political commentator, and author, Rachel Maddow to Amherst College. I didn't warn anybody that I'm enormous. <laughs> you know, the funny thing about the Wikipedia page is that uh, I have an older brother and we have been lifelong rivals. It's like team of rivals except nobody's elected. Um, and when um, Wikipedia was born and I got a Wikipedia page because somebody set that up, um, my brother called me, we don't speak all that often, but called me to threaten me specifically that he was going to rewrite it every day. <laughs> Until his truth of my achievements became the known truth of my life. This may yet happen, so if there's ever anything in there about, you know, torturing animals or being otherwise suspect in some ethically deep way and that disturbs you and makes you not like me at sight, that'll be my brother. Um, it's, it's really, really nice to be here um, at Amherst. It's a little intimidating to be here at Amherst, I will say. Um, you, your reputation precedes you, um, and so I assume that you will tear apart everything I say, <clears throat> which I'm looking forward to. Um, I, uh, I, what, I, what I'd like to do is I, I want to talk a little bit about the subject of the book, um, which sounds like more of a bummer in the abstract than it is in the specific. So I'll give you a little of the specifics, but I don't want you to feel like we should be constrained to only talking about that today, um, at least half the time, but more, probably more. Uh, I will be just happy to take your questions on anything. Um, and provided my brother is not here, I think they'll all be fair and we'll be able to go anywhere you like. <laughs> um, but as uh, President Martin said, I am about to have a birthday. And it's one of those horrible birthdays that is a very round number. I am about to turn 40 on Monday. And so I've been, uh, yeah, I made it, woo! Um, <laughs> getting old, it's better than the alternative. Um, the thing I'm starting to realize now is that I'm now working with, all the people who are working with me on my show, with the exception of only a couple people, are all younger than me. And that's when you start to realize, oh, there's a tipping point in life. Um, and I'm approaching it, but I, I uh, was thinking about it in terms of um, birth presidents. You know, everybody has a zodiac sign, right? Your zodiac sign is your month and your the day of the the month and the day you were born. I'm I'm an Aries. Um, <laughs> woo, Aries! Um, hits here for the Leos. <laughs> if you say that for the Virgos, nobody says anything. <laughs> um, all the Virgos are now angry with me. I'm sorry. Um, just kidding. Uh, but sometimes, you know, your Chinese year in which you were born, I'm an ox, which means I'm a ram ox. Tells you how much fun it is to disagree with me in my personal life. Um, but I was thinking, like, as if you are a civics dork, like if you are a civics-minded American, you should probably also know who your birth president is. Who was the president when you were, and, and that is a way to really feel old. Because even if you were only like 68, your birth president can be FDR. <laughs> like I have been feeling old, but I have nev never felt as old as when I realized that my birth president is Nixon. <laughs> I was born in April 1973 and he was president, and he was president until, when was it, August 74 he quit? So he, was like, he wasn't like my childhood president, he was my toddler president. Um, <laughs> But I realized in, 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 that I was, I was talking about some things in the book with some people who work on my show staff and they are people who their birth president is like, Poppy Bush. It's freaking crazy. So in any case, um, imagine that your birth president uh, is Poppy Bush. So let's say you are, imagine um, you're a little bit older than I guess most of you guys would 
be here. Say you were a high school senior in 2007. So you're born in 1990. Um, at that point, we were four years into Iraq. We were six years into Afghanistan. If you, at that point, were feeling a call to patriotic duty, a sense of adventure, you were thinking about training opportunities offered by a career in the US Armed Forces, when you go talk to a recruiter about joining the military, where do you tell that recruiter that you would like to end up? Four years into Iraq, six years into Afghanistan. Where do you think you're gonna go? Where do you tell the recruiter you'd like to go? Probably not a missile silo in Minot, North Dakota. In the post 9-11 era, who would want the job of sitting through a nuclear winter on the high plains, running maintenance on the 35 B-52s there, guarding the silos that housed 150 giant and largely untested intercontinental ballistic missiles, babysitting the hundreds of smaller nuclear warheads stored in sod-topped bunkers like canned fruit in a tornado shelter? Consider page 13 of a recently declassified 2007 report on the care and feeding of our nation's nuclear weapons, specifically at Barksdale, Barksdale Air Base, uh, which is in Shreveport, Louisiana. Among the recommended improvement areas in that report, number one, uh, there was corrosion on numerous storage and shipping containers. Number two, forward missile antenna sealant was delaminated. And number three, numerous air-launched cruise missiles had fungus on the leading edge of the wings. While our nuclear-armed cruise missiles were growing leading-edge wing fungus in the subtropical moisture of Louisiana, other US military flying hardware at the same time was having rather the opposite problem. In the words of Defense Industry Daily, these other planes were about to fly their wings off, and not just as a figure of speech. In 2006, the Air Force started an emergency upgrade of the nation's fleet of C-130 aircraft. After heavy service moving cargo and flying combat missions as retrofitted gunships, these huge C-130 planes, their wing boxes were failing. Wing boxes are what keep the wings on. It's what keep the wings attached to the fuselage of the plane. So you can take your pick of your maintenance priorities as an American taxpayer, right? Wings falling off enormous gunships in the Middle East and Central Asia from constant use in the longest simultaneous land wars in US history, or sedentary nuclear missiles in Shreveport growing fungus. Nukes and their auxiliary equipment were generally designed to have a lifespan of about 10 to 20 years. Back in the glory days, it was constant manufacturing and modernization that were the assumptions. But by the start of the Barack Obama presidency, some of our nuclear hardware had been in service for 40 or even 50 years. I mean, bad enough that the missiles were growing wing fungus and storage containers were rusting through. At least those problems were maybe mostly solvable with Lysol and Rust-Oleum. For the more serious nuclear maintenance issues, though, we had by then started shoveling money into something called the Stockpile Life Extension Program, which I always thought should be described as schlep in terms of its acronym, but nobody calls it that. The Stockpile Life Extension Program. Uh, whatever you call it, it is still essentially a program of artificial hips and pacemakers and penile implants for aging nukes. How would you like to be responsible for operating on a half century old nuclear bomb? How many nuclear bombs does the United States need? <laughs> yes, A. How many nuclear bombs does the United States need to complete every conceivable military mission in which we would use them? So if you think that we don't need any nuclear weapons at all, suspend that for a moment. Concede that there's some military use wherein we would like to use nuclear weapons again. How many do we need to fulfill that military mission? For reference sake, an attack with one of the nuclear weapons that we've got now would cause an explosion about 10 times the size of the explosion at Hiroshima. Can you imagine us setting off two such bombs now, each of them 10 times the size of Hiroshima? How about five of them? Can you imagine 15? Can you imagine 50? What would be on the target list? What would be on the list of 50 targets for 50 American nuclear blasts, each 10 times the size of Hiroshima? When you got to number 48, what would be the two places you still needed to drop bombs 10 times the size of Hiroshima on? 
Can you imagine us needing 50? Can you imagine us needing 500, using 500 nuclear weapons, each 10 times the size of Hiroshima? Our current arsenal of nukes is about 5,000 weapons. <clears throat> A senior defense official told me in 2011, we don't have any enemies in Congress. We have to fight Congress to cut programs, not keep them. And those are basically the only fights that the Pentagon ever loses in Washington. To paraphrase Ronald Reagan, plagiarizing Senator James Burns, talking smack about government bureaucracy, if you want to achieve immortality, see what you can do about getting yourself turned into a Pentagon program. You may eventually grow wing fungus, but you will never die. <laughs> the nuclear weapons complex, the counterinsurgency nation-building apparatus, our recently acquired fleet of $20 billion worth of mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles with these amazing V-shaped holes that disperse the energy from bombs that explode beneath them. We built this stuff and we own this stuff, but we're in the position in many cases of just trying to figure out a way to use it now. The tasks that we assign our service members are hard enough without asking them to get their work done inside the world's largest organization while dragging around decades worth of clattering battle rattle in the form of defunct and deathless programs. We all have an interest in America having an outstanding military, but that aim is not helped by exempting the military from the competition for resources. With no competition for resources, with no check on its growth, with no rival for its political influence, the superfunded, super empowered national security state has become Leviathan and we are weaker for it and not stronger. So I am not an expert on war. Um, I'm not an expert on the military. My gig is politics. And this is a civilian book written for a civilian audience from a civilian um, perspective. I, I am, that said, I am not a pacifist. I have a lot of respect for pacifism. I think that pacifism is a mature and fully cognizant philosophy and strategy that should not be dismissed as naive. Although I respect the view of pacifists, I, I do not share the belief that war is always the single worst option, that war is never, ever, ever necessary. And because of that, I respect the decision of our country to maintain a robust military. I don't think that people who don't support that decision are necessarily wrong or naive, but that's how I feel. At the same time, I don't feel like we're doing any favors to that military by insulating them from a competition for resources. I think they should compete with the other things our country wants to do besides maintain the military. In part, the problem is that we then saddle the military with all sorts of stuff that doesn't make sense for its own priorities. We had this um, fight between the Pentagon and Congress this year over the stupidity of the sequester, right, which was designed to be stupid. Oh, look, it turned out stupid. Yeah, that's how we worked. Right. <laughs> it was designed to be a bad idea. People are shocked that it is. Um, <coughs> But last year, the fight between the Pentagon and Congress was over tanks. It did not get a lot of attention, but I found it fascinating because the fight was whether or not the military should have a whole swath of new tanks. Congress wanted the military to have the tanks and the military did not want them. <laughs> Think about that for a second. The Congress is demanding that we spend the money over the objections of the Pentagon. I mean, fights in Washington are supposed to be about politicians wanting to cut something and then entrenched bureaucracies and their constituencies saying, no, 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 don't cut us. But this is entirely backwards. This is Congress saying, take the extra money in your budget. The Pentagon saying, no, 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 we don't want it. And Congress saying, no, you have to have it. And them saying, no, no, please don't make us. And ultimately, Congress wins. What kind of math is this? Right? This does not happen in any other area of American public policy. But it's what happens in this field. And, and that, in, you know, oh, and there's another one too. This one's been driving me nuts. We have, I, I keep pitching this to my show staff that we should do a big segment on this, but every time we write on the whiteboard what the segment's gonna be, the way I write it up on the whiteboard is missile defense, and everybody goes, oh God, please no. Please don't make us research missile defense. Because I read about missile defense in my spare time. But if I want to do it on the show, that means a producer or three have to then start reading about it too. Which is fun if you're talking about like, dumb Republicans said dumb thing. But if you're really talking about how well the Alaskan middle, uh, mid, uh, missile defense... <laughs> <laughs> do you mind if I just tell you one missile defense thing though really quick? All right. So missile defense. Uh, in Alaska, there's a missile coming. We're going to shoot it down. Since 2005, 
there have been five tests of the missile defense system that's in Alaska. It worked twice. <laughs> now, if you think about what a missile defense system does, that's bad, right? <laughs> because, not only because you want to be more effective than that, but because if you have a missile defense system in place, it's not that hard to imagine that you might behave more belligerently or provocatively or in some other way that might, even in a marginal sense, be more likely to provoke a missile strike from somewhere else because in the back of your mind you're thinking, hey, 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 we've got the defense. <laughs> that works two out of five times. <laughs> and the other thing you wonder is, well, how come it hasn't been tested more than that since 2005? There's a great answer to that. Before 2005, we were testing the Alaskan missile defense thing all the time, and it was constantly failing spectacularly. Because when missile defense fails, oftentimes you can see it failing, like, oh, miss, look. <laughs> and people can see it from all over, and so reporters could cover the fact that it was not working. And so there was this very stern report by the sort of missilegentsia in Washington about what was going on with these failed, constantly failed missile defense tests in Alaska that were becoming kind of a national joke among people who read about this stuff for fun. And the conclusion of the report was, well, the point of missile defense is that we're supposed to deter anybody from shooting missiles at us. Because they're going to think, I'm going to shoot a missile at them, they're going to shoot my missile down, and then they're going to nail me. So we better not shoot missiles at them in the first place. It won't do any good. All it will do is invite provocation. It's all cost to us and no benefit. That's the whole point of having a missile defense system in. They said, the report in 2005, because we are failing so often at these missile tests, we think the deterrence effect may be wearing off. <laughs> and so the recommendation was, let's stop testing it so much. <laughs> Amazing. That's why we've only had five tests since 2005. So since then, last year, the National Academies did a big blue ribbon, totally comprehensive look at this system to decide what to do with it. The one that's too embarrassing to test. And they did this big review and the Academy's panel on this was stacked with people who support missile defense. And they did this long review and they looked into it and what they decided was, we need to get rid of this whole thing. We like the concept of missile defense, but this one does not work. We need to replace it entirely. Let's sell it for scrap. Congress just decided to spend 400 million more dollars on it. They call it the blunder in the tundra. <laughs> Alternatively, the disaster in Alaska. <laughs> See, I think that could make for TV. My staff does not agree. They're like, so when you do this in the meeting, pew, what are you imagining us putting on TV? And I said, just keep the camera on me. I'll go like this, pew. <laughs> Everybody turns to Hannity. Yeah. <clears throat> The insulation in those kinds of decisions, the tanks thing, the missile defense thing, the insulation that, that cossets and I think does no favors to the decisions on what we spend uh, in terms of defense is related to the same kind of insulation that plagues the decisions about how we use our military and how frequently. The thrust of this book basically is that over the past 30 or 40 years, in a nonpartisan way, in a way that I think was non-conspiratorial, that was just people trying to get around frustrating impediments to doing what they wanted to do and what they thought was right. We as a country changed our way of going to war, so it is not so much of a hassle anymore. I do think it's nonpartisan. I think it's presidents and other leadership on both sides just making rationally understandable decisions. If you look at them in their temporal context, you can understand why they made these decisions. Making these decisions, though, that all go the same direction, that all make the use of force easier and less controversial. So if you don't want to convince Congress to get on board, even though the Constitution says the power to wage war is vested in the legislature, right? But if you don't want to get Congress in, in, in involved, you just come up with ways to tell yourself that it's okay for the president to start a war whether or not Congress is there. There's a whole bunch in the book, um, there's a long chapter called Isle of Spice. Um, about Grenada, about Reagan's war in Grenada. And nobody else folds Grenada into relevant modern history of American warfare, but what I think is important about it from a political stance is that Reagan didn't tell Congress he was going to wage war on Grenada. They asked, and he said, no, I'm not doing that. 
The press secretary said it was preposterous that anybody might be planning to invade Grenada. And then they invaded Grenada and Congress learned about it on the news. And that effectively was crazy at the time and Congress was very angry, but it set a precedent. <clears throat> so if you wanna get around Congress, you can get around Congress. If you wanna get around the public, if you don't wanna upset the public by say calling up too many Americans to go, one of the modern ways we do that is that we call up private companies instead of calling up individual citizens. So you can augment the number of people you call up with contractors. You know, private companies don't even have to tell the public when their personnel are killed in war zones. So policymakers can really count on those people not being missed as much as soldiers would be. The way that started um, was again, relatively recently, former Vice President Dick Cheney was defense secretary. And when he was defense secretary, he sort of pioneered this strategy of bringing on people to do what had previously been seen as military functions, but he thought could be done by companies cheaper. Um, and we really started doing that in a big way during the first Gulf War, um, and it was Dick Cheney's idea. But even though it is easy as a liberal to sneer at anything Dick Cheney does and say, oh, Cheney did it, so it must have been evil and conspiratorial, Frankly, once Bill Clinton and Al Gore were in charge, not long after, they fully embraced that doctrine. And when they went to war in the Balkans, a big way that they avoided calling up too many people was by making sure there were a lot of contractors there too. And it grew and grew over different administrations. They all had their reasons for liking the idea. Turns out it's not cheaper, by the way. If you don't want to persuade Congress, if you don't want to upset people by calling up too many people, let's say you don't even want to take the trouble to persuade the American people that this cause you want to fight for is worth American treasure and American blood, the easiest way around that is just to do it in secret. You don't want to explain where we are at war or the tactics we're using in that war, then do it in secret. That's why it's really important that the CIA is waging the drone war in such a big way. And on the one hand, if you're at the sharp end of that war, you don't care whether it's a US Air Force pilot pulling the trigger sitting at an air base somewhere back in the US or whether it's a CIA pilot sitting in Jalalabad or sitting in Langley. It doesn't really matter to you on the ground, but it matters to us as Americans because when the CIA does stuff, not only is it secret, the same way a lot of our military activity is secret, but when the CIA does stuff, it's covert and covert is different than clandestine. Covert means that legally, if you ask a policymaker, did this thing just happen, and it was a CIA covert action, the policymaker can lie to you, even under oath, and not be prosecuted for it. So we're waging war that we're not allowed to know about? That's a way to keep it, that's a way to make it painless for us. One of the things that, um, you know, the Obama administration carried on a lot of the national security policies of the George W. Bush administration, but one of the things they did actually change, which I think they should get credit for, uh, is the paying for it scam. If you wanna make wars painless, one of the other ways to make it painless is to try to shield the cost of it. Pretend there isn't a cost. You know, cut taxes at the same time we're starting wars. Make people think that wars are free. That's what the George W. Bush administration did, right? Remember, they didn't put the cost of the wars in the budget. They instead had the wars as um, every year it would be an emergency supplemental. An emergency every year. A year, like it's like you're a goldfish in a little bowl swimming around. Look, a castle, look, a castle, look, a castle. Every year you're shocked and amazed. Wow, it's another emergency. <laughs> the Obama administration stopped doing that and started putting the war cost in the budget so we'd at least admit that there was one. So we've, we've come up with all of these ways to wage war in ways that got around the constraints that were put there on purpose to make war a discomforting state for Americans. I don't think that our founding fathers, I guess we're supposed to call them that, um, I don't think that the guys who wrote the Constitution, um, <laughs> I just, I, it's weird, it's not even a gender thing, I just feel weird about putting it as like a family thing, what does that make us, the children, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we're now like the great, great, great grandchildren of the fathers and there were no mothers and doesn't that imply that like we're starfish? I don't know. <laughs> just, <laughs> never, anyway. The genius demigods who wrote the Constitution. <laughs> I do not think that they meant us to be a pacifist country. I mean, I think that, you know, if all we were doing was petitioning the king for our grievances, 
things would not have worked out the way they did. But I also think that one of the things they were really pissed about, and one of the reasons that led them to wage war against their colonial masters, was that they did not want to foot the bill anymore for British military adventurism. And what's the one really weird pre-modern thing that sticks out in the Bill of Rights? Quartering soldiers. What's that in the Bill of Rights for? Because they used to stick us with that. In terms of supporting the British military, the giant empiric British military, we had to, and among other things, not only to pay all the taxes, but we had to quarter their soldiers. And we resented it. And they wrote the Constitution and the debates around how we should be structured as a government, a lot of them were about how we could become a more peaceable nation how we could become a country that was more comfortable at peace than we were at war, how we would be a country where war would be a temporary state and where it'd be something that it took a lot to get us into it because boy, they did not like supporting the British way of militarism. So they structured us to be a deliberately peaceable nation. And that inheritance, I feel like, is genius. And we've traded it away in these little ways over and over again over the past 30 or 40 years not because we were trying to undermine ourselves as a constitutional republic, but because we forgot that that stuff was there for a reason. And when we got around it and we came up with ways so that it's the president and it's not the Congress, and the cost is blind. And all of these other things that we did to make it easier, we were giving up one of the most important constitutional inheritances we had. <clears throat> as civilians, the consequence of all of these changes has been that war is something that we don't feel. You talk to veterans, um, particularly like special skills operators who've been called on to deploy time and time again since 9-11, you talk to their families, their spouses, their parents, and their life has been harrowing for the past 12 years. The gap between the life experience of American civilians and people in military families over the past 12 years is enormous. And I think dangerous for us as a country I mean, we, we have fought a lot of wars as a country. They may have designed us to be a peaceable nation. We have not been all that peaceable. But, I mean, we fought the Revolutionary War, Civil War, First World War, Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, I mean, 1812, the Spanish-American War, freaking Grenada, Bosnia, Panama, Gulf War I. We fought a lot of wars. And we are a big country. And it is a big deal for a country as big as ours, who has fought as many wars as we have already, to right now be fighting the longest war in our history but we are in the longest war in our history right now. And for eight and a half years of that war, we were also fighting simultaneously another war that was also one of the longest wars in our history. And less than 1% of our population took care of both of those for us at the same time. While well, we got tax cuts, it's all free. The first round of Bush tax cuts <clears throat> Bush was inaugurated in January or February 2001. First round of tax cuts was June 2001. Then three months later, 9-11 happens, and we invade Afghanistan. There's no discussion about maybe dialing back those tax cuts. I mean, those are huge, historic tax cuts. But three months later, we get attacked, we declare a global war, and we start a land war in, in landlocked Central Asia. We're not gonna, we never talk about giving those tax cuts back. Rather, less than two years after we invade Afghanistan, we start another simultaneous war. And then, a couple weeks later, we give ourselves another round of tax cuts. Normal countries do not do this. <laughs> but for us, war feels free. And so now we have this difficult relationship, a complex relationship, and I think an emotionally fraught relationship with the Americans who have done the fighting while we have been at home enjoying our tax cuts without much feeling the wars at all. You talk to veterans now, especially people who are home for good, who are not gonna deploy again, people who've left the military, who've spent a lot of time in these wars, and they tell you that they fear pity and they fear fear, that interacting with civilians who have no idea what they've been through and whose lives have been so different the thing they worry about is being pitied and being feared, and they're two sides of the same coin. Because they're both about alienation. They're both, I don't know you, right? They're both, uh, I may have respect for you, I may be interested in you, but I don't understand you. They both come from the same place. We as civilians are alienated from the people who have been fighting in our name. Well, there's actually one other thing that I wanna read from the book, actually from an Amherst alum who's the founder of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, uh, Paul Rykoff. Um, 
Paul told me in 2011, <clears throat> it's like AIDS was 30 years ago. It's a huge crisis for us, but no one else in the country thinks they are us. No one even thinks they are like us. So our lives and their lives have been very different for more than a decade now. Our sacrifice and their sacrifice almost are opposite images. If you think, I mean, you think about a family that's dealing with their first deployment of their service member or their second deployment. And then you think about somebody dealing with their sixth deployment and their seventh deployment. The level of sacrifice and the level of distance from what civilians are doing in their lives accrues over time with more and more deployments and more and more time at war, right? But as the wars get older and older, we actually pay, pay less and less attention to them, not more attention to them. So as their sacrifice gets worse, our attention gets less. But we do feel it, right? There was a two-minute um, ad in the Super Bowl this year that was voiced by Oprah. <coughs> you have been cried over. You have been prayed for. You have been missed. The Rose Bowl staged a homecoming of a soldier from Afghanistan on a moving float in the parade this year. Uh, my insurance company, which is USAA, because my dad's a vet. It's really good insurance if you can get it. Um, I love USAA. In their ads right now, though, they are faking home soldier homecomings in their ads. They have actors pretending to be soldiers coming home from war with actor children pretending to be excited to see them. You can go to the Welcome Home blog online, which bills itself as the number one site for videos of surprise military homecomings. You know, and, you know, I, and I, if I sound cynical about, about these things sort of being milked for their emotional value, I actually don't feel all that, at least I don't feel as cynical about that as I sound. The monetizable, guaranteed, marketable emotional payoff that we civilians now really dependably demonstrate in reaction to seeing how much soldiers and their families have given up when we have given up nothing is an important thing. I mean, I, I know that those USAA ads are actors, but I cry every time. I cry through the whole Oprah ad. When I want the, the tom soldier homecomings, have you seen the one like with the guy's Great Dane? Like puts his shoulders, paws on his shoulders, and he, oh, I just weep. I cry at everything, but I particularly cry at that stuff. We cry when we see soldiers rush into the arms of their kids and their wives and their husbands and their dogs because that distance that they are returning from means something to us. We buy soldiers beers when we see them in uniform. We applaud them on planes when the captains point them out. Jeep decides to sell cars during the Super Bowl in partnership with the USO and Oprah agrees to narrate it because this is potent stuff for us and it's important. We feel it that way because there is an American patriotic thing going on that is a discomforting feeling with wars having been fought for us that had nothing to do with us. So the changes that got us there, I think, are changes that have happened over a short time. I don't think there was a conspiracy. I think these were understandable decisions made by people looking at short-term political necessity. But I think that they can be undone. They haven't been going on for that long. And I at least hope that we can fight about it. We can at least have an argument about it rather than assuming that this is the way it's going to be forever because it hasn't actually been this way for this long. Fighting and dying in the name of the United States of America, enduring the sacrifice that comes with going to war is a potent thing to us for a reason. There's a reason you feel tearful when you see soldier homecomings. It should be that way. The distance that we feel is legitimate patriotic discomfort that we did not spend the last 12 years at war these other people did it for us. And whether the next war is Iran or Syria or here or somewhere so far off that we can't foresee it now, please, it should never ever feel when the United States is at war like it's not us. Like it's not the country going to war and it's no big deal. We need to fix that and I think we can fix that. And that's what I wrote this book about. And the Odyssey Bookshop is downstairs, in case you didn't get to them on the ground floor if you want to buy a copy of it before you leave. But I'm happy to talk to you about anything related to this or totally unrelated, as long as you're not my brother.
always hot in Johnson Chapel. It's a little schwitzy. It's very schwitzy here, always. Oh, it's for me? Yes. So uh, you see the microphones, and what we're going to ask you to do is line up at the microphones, go to the microphones if you wish to ask a question. Uh, some people have already done it. Uh, please don't take the mic off the stand. Are there any other instructions I'm supposed to give? No. Okay, good. I ready? have one special request about questions. Good. Um, end whatever you're saying with a question mark. <laughs> good rule. Yeah, let's have questions. Should we start here? Are there, are there microphones upstairs? Yes, yes. Okay, so I just need to know where to watch here and here. And that bright light is not going to help with that. No, there's okay. no microphone there. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Just, um, I guess first I wanted to say thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Oh, all right. I'll talk into the mic. <laughs> um, so I was, um, I was, I really love your show, and I was home over uh, spring break and watching it with a good friend of mine, and um, it was uh, the, ish the uh, episode where you're talking about the release of um, the, I guess it was the documents that showed that Nixon had uh, deliberately tried to sabotage the, um, the peace treaty in 1968 that would have ended the Vietnam War uh, and would have saved uh, 15,000 American men from dying. And um, you said that uh, because Nixon is gone and uh, there's no one around that we can hold accountable, um, that the most important thing that we can do is to talk about it and to um, change the way that we tell the story of Vietnam. And so that's sort of the, I guess, like the reason for me asking this question is because I think it is important to talk about, especially given um, what you were just saying about the emotional relationship that we have to um, our servicemen and women who serve. That's redundant. <laughs> I'm really nervous. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. You're making sense. Yes, thank God. Um, I guess my, my question for you is, uh, it's twofold. The first is, um, do you think the public knowledge that there are people in our government who are willing to prolong war for personal gain, uh, do you think that that's going to be internalized into the political and social conversations that we have about the relationship between citizen and state? And the second one is, what do you think that this means for our relationship with the rest of the world? Thank you. That is an excellent question. Um, you know, I did this documentary um, a few weeks ago called Hubris that aired on MSNBC. Um, oh, I'm glad you saw it. Um, and a couple things about, about Hubris. One was that it, it was very popular, which was awesome, because everybody tells me that um, you shouldn't talk about national security that much, and you shouldn't expect politicians to fight about national security that much because people don't care about it. Turns out people do. It was the most watched documentary MSNBC had done in a decade. Um, and I talk a lot about national security, and my show does okay, and this book's done great, and I feel like we should change the common wisdom that people aren't interested in this subject. But part of the reason that I did Hubris and part of the reason that I did that segment on Nixon is I do feel like um, both when things are in the more distant past, we have to make sure that we get the history right when we tell them so that the lessons are, that we learn from those errors are the right lessons. But when people are still around, there is actually a way to hold them accountable. And if you were one of the people, for example, who told the country that Saddam's weapons of mass destruction were why we needed to start that war, then you might persuade me to listen to you about light rail or vaccination policy or something, but I'm never gonna listen to you about national security again. And to have the spokesman for the Iraq war in Baghdad, Dan Senor, as the top foreign policy advisor to the Republican presidential candidate in 2012, to have the foreign policy address at the Republican convention given by Condoleezza Rice, to have Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz and Donald Rumsfeld and Tony Blair and all these guys giving interviews saying, yeah, we did nothing wrong, we did everything right, we would do it all over again. And then they get asked back to talk more. Um, I do feel like there ought to be the possibility of failure in national security and particularly breaking trust. And I think that the first line in George W. Bush's obituary should be that he lied to us about Iraq. And I will work on that. So. 
in, in terms of how other countries deal with us, I think, yeah. I mean, if there isn't internal accountability in American politics for being duplicitous about things as big as war, then why would anybody ever trust us in terms of making difficult alliance decisions about how to support us? So I think that the current president's aggressive multilateralism is an attempt to sort of regain other countries' trust, both in the terms of our internal politics and the way we deal with other countries, but it's, it's really hard. I think it's really hard to make the case that we learned the lesson of Iraq and that people paid a price, because the only people that paid a, paid a price were the Iraqis and our service members. So thank you. Um, that's interesting, the comment about Nixon, because um, I'm one of those people who ended up in Vietnam because of Nixon. Um, so what is the truth? You know, I watch hubris twice. What is the truth about why we really went? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I am right now trying to persuade MSNBC to let me do hubris part two, actually, which to answer that question, because I think there actually is an answer. Um, in part, I, I mentioned Tony Blair a moment ago because my mind is on the British side of that question. A lot of the documents about what the governments were thinking about and talking about in making arrangements for ahead of the Iraq invasion when they weren't making plans for how to govern Iraq um, are now declassified. And they've declassified more of them in Britain than they have here, but they do paint a pretty clear picture about what they were planning on going for. And it's exactly what you think. But I want to do a movie about it, so I don't want to talk about it more now. <laughs> but whatever you're thinking right now, you're right. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, Rachel. Thank you for coming. I went to school, to college in the 70s, and one of the most vivid memories I have of that time was being here with friends at Amherst. Of course, it was just boys then. And sitting in a room while they picked the draft numbers, knowing that every kid was in jeopardy of getting, you know, what we refer to as a low number. So all of you who are waiting to hear about internships and summer jobs, that meant nothing. It was just, what was your number? And while I wouldn't want any of you to be in jeopardy, I think the fact that the kids, these types of kids were in jeopardy, got everyone involved in the anti-war movement. We were all involved. So I, I'm wondering what you think about reinstating the draft. It's an excellent question, and thank you for that. Um, I have complicated feelings about the draft. The start of the book, a lot of it is about what Johnson was thinking when he decided to escalate in Vietnam. So Johnson had, his public line on Vietnam was that he did not want to escalate. His line was, we shouldn't be sending American boys thousands of miles away to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. And he didn't want to escalate. And then he became president. We all know the circumstances in which he became president. And once he was president, he became convinced, for whatever reason, that we did need to escalate in Vietnam. But he still liked his public arguments that we shouldn't. And he didn't want to change them. And he didn't want to have to go persuade people that he was going back on what he had said before. And now that he was president, he was going to ask for a lot of people to go and that he, we did need to escalate. He decided we needed to escalate, but he didn't want to make a public case for it. How was he going to do it? Where was he going to get the manpower? He needed 100,000 more people to go. Where was he going to get them from? Well, he decided that he definitely was not going to use the Guard and the Reserves. He said he did not want to essentially hear from the parents, uh, the, the, he did not want to hear from, the, did not want members of Congress hearing from powerful constituents who had been able to get their sons into the National Guard and National Reserve as a way to try to avoid service. The Guard and Reserve at that point was seen as a way that maybe you could serve your country, but maybe not end up in war. And so we thought if I called up the Guard and Reserves, all of these people with political capital are gonna be really mad. And I do not wanna hear from people with political capital. I want this to be quiet. And therefore, he said cheerily, and I've heard the tone of it, because we've got his White House tapes now. He says cheerily, I'm just gonna double my draft calls, thinking then nobody will care. Because his idea about the draft was that the people who are gonna get drafted do not have political capital. The people who are gonna get drafted are people who do not have the wherewithal to, get them, to prevent themselves from being drafted. He thought all the important people would be able to get out of it, and therefore nobody would hear about it. And of course, 
he maybe was right for five minutes, but it didn't work out that way. And you're absolutely right that the draft and the way that the draft touched so many different people and so many different types of American life is what brought about the possibility of a broad-based anti-war movement. But when Nixon was, I mean, when LBJ was making that calculation, that was not the way that he thought about it. And the way that he thought about it, I think, was more politically accurate for a long time. So all, all this to say that I think that the thing that we're trying to get at with the draft is to connect civilians and our sacrifice to what we are doing abroad. And I think the draft is a way to get there, but it's not a magic bullet, because sometimes the draft can work in, work in ways that just reify existing structures in terms of who gets insulated and who doesn't. So I, I think it's not magic, but it is interesting. And, and you know, you talk to people in the military and they don't want to return to the draft because they think that what they do is very hard and very difficult and often very technical, and the last thing they want is their ranks filled out with people who do not want to be there. They want it to be a professional, all-volunteer all military, and they think we are less military ready if we have to deal with the draft. Some people, though, Stanley McChrystal, who was the commander in Afghanistan who had to step down after that Rolling Stone article, he wrote a book. He's now out of back and trying to get back into public life, wrote a book. And in the interviews he's doing talking about the book, actually said, I was post-Vietnam military. I was totally set that we should never have a draft, that we needed an all-volunteer professional military until I came home from whatever he had, 11 deployments after 9-11. And I realized that nobody in the country who is not in the military knows where I have been or what I have been doing. And maybe I feel like, okay, we need a draft. It'll be bad for the military, but we should do it anyway. So it's a, it's a complicated and interesting question, but I think the most important thing is the emotion behind it, which is how do we connect ourselves to our wars? And the basic question is that it ought to be hard. It ought to be really hard. You ought to have to persuade the whole country, involve us every step of the way, not shield us from any of it. And there ought, it ought to be the basis on which we elect or fire our public officials. But thank you for the question. Thanks very much. Thank you. I will give shorter answers from now on. I'm sorry, I realize I'm filibustering. Hi, I love your show. I kind of have a two-parter. First of all, I can't imagine you wrote the book without throwing things against the wall. I mean, as I was listening, driving up here. But I wanted to know, you, in an interview you, you have mentioned, you really do not like to write. It's very painful. And the interview said that, um, I guess you had said, that you had to write this. So I, I'm interested in knowing that. And the other thing is, since your father is a veteran, did he kind of read the rough draft and what was his reaction, having been military, to the book you wrote? Thank you. Um, I do hate to write. Um, it just, it's a, it, uh, I don't mind, I write every day for my show. And for some reason, psychologically, I do not mind writing, I think of it uh, for the voice, writing something that I'm going to speak I have no like writer's block about that at all. I can do that all day long. But when I'm writing something for the I, meaning I am committing to it, and there's no chance for me to either inflect it or add a dramatic pause or ad lib something around it in case it's wrong, I'm committing to it because you're going to read it, and I'm not going to be there when you read it, that kills me. <laughs> it took me years to write this. The reason that I wanted to write it, and it, it's a little bit of a weird thing to decide to write a book when my job right now is talking about anything I want. I mean, I had a radio show when I got the when I got the book contract and then I got a TED TV show thereafter, and they really do give me total editorial freedom. I can talk about whatever I want. But I felt like this was something that I felt like was going on in the country that I could not do in a broadcast form. It's sort of a 200 page long argument. You need, I need that much time to explain what I mean. And I kept running up against wanting to say this, wanting to articulate this, but not having room between you know, 17 minute com pre-commercial blocks to do it. So nothing said I couldn't do it, I just couldn't tell it any shorter. So that's why I did it. Um, my dad is responsible for um, fixing several typos in the draft. <laughs> At one point I re referred to an Air Force private instead of an airman. He was very angry about that because he was an Air Force captain. Um, other than that, he did give me some sort of technical help. He's really into airplanes and so every time I talked about airplanes he was into that. But he was very kind of sort of staying out of the way of the argument. My dad is a, um, was kind of a Reagan Democrat, a real centrist guy who, um, like a lot of people, particularly of his Vietnam generation, was absolutely radicalized by George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and had been a real centrist until then and is now significantly to my left. Like, I have to calm dad down now. He's, 
He's pissed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is, is. Can everybody hear me? I'm too short for this, even with four inch heels. Oh yeah. What can I say? Taller. Uh, my name is Caroline, and I have a question for you. I heard you allude to Syria a little bit, and I was wondering, what's your opinion on, quote unquote, humanitarian intervention, and why have we done? Why have the we? I'm not even American. Why have the United States done that in Libya, but not in Syria? Excellent question. Um, we have yet to understand what the Obama doctrine is in terms of how he intervenes and when and where. But the, I have asked members of the administration this question, what is it about Syria that does not meet the threshold that Libya met? And their answer is actually pretty empirical. Their answer is that we will intervene not unilaterally, we will intervene multilaterally, and we will intervene only with a multilateral set of partners that is acceptable to the people with whom we are intervening. So they felt like in Libya, with the Arab League wanting to be involved and saying that we're going to put Arab League troops in the front of all of this, that will be the reason that we're going. There's nothing like that in, they see as equivalent in Syria that would ease their way in. I, I mean, that's their explanation for it. I have to believe that they also don't want to be intervening in something that looks like it still might go on for a long time. The tipping point in Libya, they said, was about trying to sort of head off um, what they thought would be a s massive civilian massacre and destruction of a major city. Um, I think that probably the real politic tipping point in Libya was that it seemed like Gaddafi was done and they wanted to make sure it ended in a way that was relatively controlled. I'm not sure they believe that about Assad. So it's less, it's not satisfying, but that's, I mean, that's, that's the way, I think that's the way they approach it. I think they are small C conservative, they are non-interventionist, they are multilateral, and they do not want to be out front of anything. Do you disagree? What if it ends up like Rwanda? What if it does? I mean, that's, I think that's what they're up against. And what, when do you decide, okay, it's about to become like Rwanda? I mean, you know, and the same decision in Congo. The same decision, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, honestly, I am... Is it because uh, there's no oil in Syria? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Iran is right there in the neighborhood? I'm not sure that Libya is going to redound to a change in international oil access. So, I mean, that, that change in Libya had happened in a different way. I mean, ask me about Iraq, and we can talk there, but if you're talking about it, under Obama, Syria versus Libya, I'm not sure that that flies. But, I mean, if you look at human case for humanitarian intervention, I mean, have you all seen the Google Earth photos of the North Korean prison camps? I mean, right now, if we talk about humanitarian invention, think, intervention, think about that. But also, put yourself back in the mindset of post 9-11, and the United States is gonna go invade somebody, and we're worried about a tyrannical, unpredictable, undeterrable dictator with weapons of mass destruction. That's what we're worried about. And we never talk about Kim Jong-il. Instead, we go make up some WMD thing about Saddam that wasn't true. I mean, our arguments and the facts on the ground um, stray. I mean, well, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. The other night, you had uh, Nicole Wallace on your show. Yeah. Who worked for the Bush administration, Bush II, and worked for John McCain. And she had filed a brief along with others against the Defense of Marriage Act. That along with the, the stance of some Republicans to change immigration, do you see that as a play for certain people within the party to move it more to the center? Like, uh, meaning they're just being electorally strategic and they don't really believe it? No, maybe they do believe it, but maybe, but maybe they see this is a good time uh, to kind of make that shift because they've, they've lost a presidential election, they've lost some, some momentum and some ground with lots of different groups in America, that this sort of makes them a little bit uh, friendlier and fuzzier? Yes, I think there is a friendly and fuzzy initiative underway. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> what's really interesting is that uh, Liz Cheney had an op-ed somewhere yesterday arguing against these friendly, fuzzy factions, <laughs> saying, it's just she had a great line, something like, in my experience, anybody telling the Republican Party to moderate its views is either wrong or a Democrat or both. Ah. 
So the Republican Party is having this amazing internal conversation right now where there are a lot of people in the party who may be wrong, in my opinion, on a lot of things, but who are saying also, you know what, we actually need to modernize as a party. We need to speak to more people. We need to get real on the issue of immigration reform, which has been kicked down the road for way too long. We need to get real on the issue of same-sex marriage rights. We need to get real on a lot of issues where America has left the Republican Party in the dust, and we ought to catch up. But those people are not necessarily the power brokers in the party. There's 131 Republicans signed on to that brief that Nicole was part of with the, uh, the Prop 8 case. Only two of them were elected. So neat, 131 Republicans you might have heard of, none of whom are going to face re-election after doing this. And after that brief was filed, the Speaker of the House came out and said, I will, not only do I not support marriage equality, I never will. Reince Priebus, the chairman of the party, came out and said marriage is between a man and a woman. Marco Rubio gave a speech in which he said, if I define marriage as a traditional, in the traditional way, I don't want to be called a bigot. He got a huge round of applause. There is a fight going on in the party, and the modernizers are a vocal minority who Democrats like to talk to a lot and liberals like to talk to a lot because we believe their message that the Republican Party looks prehistoric. But the Republicans who are actually in charge don't believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Eric. I'm a senior. I'm a chemistry major. Um, <laughs> just, just by habit, uh, just say that now. I'm glad to know it. That's good. Yep. Why did you major in chemistry? Yep. Uh, oh, wait, why? Why, yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, really turn the tables here. Um, uh, short answer is that I really liked chemistry AP in high school and got here, seemed like still a good choice. Um, Did you ever think about changing once you were here? Yeah, actually, I thought about being an English major instead. Ooh. Uh, yeah, that's, what, that's most people's response. Um, <laughs> Wait, did you get to take lots of English courses while you were still majoring in chemistry, or did you have to take so much chemistry and other tech stuff, that techie stuff, that you didn't <laughs> end up taking enough English? Um, I mean, if, if this were a tour, I'd say that's a great plug for the open curriculum. Um, <laughs> well done. Uh, thank you. Um... But no, to answer your question, I, I, did, I did get to take a, 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 <laughs> quite a number of classes in English. Um, so that was really great. Um, so uh, to answer my question, I guess. Uh, I really enjoyed talking with you. <laughs> thank you. I mean, I'm available like, you know, all the time. Well, yeah. Wow, this is, this, this is great. <laughs> Susan wants to talk to you. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I have to admit that, uh, first off, I, I haven't seen your show. Uh, I think that after my thesis is turned in, I might watch it uh, now. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, but um, my perception, I mean, I'm trying to, I, I want to phrase this in a way that, that isn't, uh, it doesn't sound like it. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, the, so basically, basically like, I'll, I'll just kind of try and generalize as much as I can. So <clears throat> I wonder what your thoughts are on like, the perception that MSNBC and Fox News are kind of like you know, the two sides um, and that you know, cable news has kind of devolved into like a partisan divide where like, you know, I would argue that MSC's, MSNBC is like, more often than not giving the more accurate uh, or at least the the one I'd like to believe in um, view of things. But nevertheless, just, I mean, the perception is out there that, you know, MSC, Fox News, it's like, you know, the le left TV and right TV. Um, and then CNN is kind of like the, you know, they're like kind of muddling around, they don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> and so, I just, I, I mean, I, I, mean, I, <laughs> I, I only know uh, of MSNBC and, and Fox News kind of in that way, having not watched them very much. And I wonder, kind of, being on the inside and like hearing that from the outside, what, what is that like? And do you feel like, well, A, I guess, do you feel like that's true? And then B, do you feel any uh, sort of obligation to change that perception or, or do you even think it's a bad thing? Gotcha. Um, I would say to anybody who had that perception, you should watch. 
you might not have that perception. I mean, certainly MSNBC has put people who identify as liberals on television, particularly in primetime, and Fox has put people who identify as conservatives on, particularly in primetime, and so that it makes it easy to say that we are mirror images of each other, but I do think that we approach what we do differently. Um, and it's, I, I don't think that what they're doing is bad and what we're doing is all that much better in a way, but I do think we actually have different approaches. The, the thing that is very different structurally at Fox is that the guy who runs Fox is a lifelong Republican Party operative who sees his job as trying to elect Republican candidates to office. And Republican talking points are given, or I shouldn't say that, Fox News talking points um, are given to their hosts and their shows to structure what they're saying so as to advance a particular point of view. Um, the guy who runs MSNBC, I don't even think he votes. <laughs> like, I, if, if he does, I could not tell you who he voted for. And it's not because I don't know him. I spend a ton of time with him. He's just a totally apolitical guy um, who has decided that MSNBC can offer this thing that nobody else was offering, which was people who overtly identify themselves as liberal and are willing to talk about the news from that perspective. But the idea that we are working collectively as a project to try to advance Democratic Party interests is just not true. It's just not what happens um, in our building. And we are right across the street from each other, which helps with the metaphor. Um, <laughs> so, and that's, again, that's not, not to say that what Fox is doing is, doing is bad, it's just different. And I, a number of the Fox hosts are pals of mine. I get along with uh, the, the ones of them that I know. I get along with very well. I actually get along very well with Roger Ailes, who's the president of Fox. But him, him as the president of Fox and Phil Griffin as the president of MSNBC, they have different jobs. They're trying to do different things. So, uh, you know, I, I, like their, I like edgy media. And if edgy media comes with people who identify themselves as coming from a particular ideological place, then so be it. I recognize that some people feel like there's a cost to that, but I feel like we all have a lot to offer, too. So thank you. You should watch sometime. I, I will. Let thank me know you. what you think. So unfortunately, actually, the chemistry major stole my question. I was going to ask about the media's role, um, you know, in the political game. But you have another question? Yeah. Well, I was going to sort of like, uh, if it's all right, if I could just go off that question, just kind of ask you to elaborate on it more, just through my uh, question. So, I, uh, I'll start off with a little tale. I lost my job at the end of uh, 2011, and uh, so I had a little bit of time on my hands. Um, so I took a couple days and I sat and I watched CNN, you know, straight from eight in the morning, seven in the morning to ten o'clock at night. I did the same thing with Fox News and MSNBC. And what I sort of realized was that CNN is, is a news channel. You'll, you'll get informed, you'll hear stories that are uplifting, some that are depressing, you know, all over the place. And Fox News, what, what they're trying to do is, is push an agenda and push an ideology. And what I realized MSNBC does is take both sides and it's sort of a political channel. It's not a news channel. You're not gonna get news. You're not gonna hear, I mean, you'll hear like some breaking news occasionally, but it's really a political channel on both sides. So when it comes to the issues, whether it's guns, abortion, you know, what, whatever it may be, just your thoughts on the, on the service those three networks do to the American people, because, you know, you're not even going to hear the same story. I mean, you watch Fox News and you're going to hear, you know, is Obama going to bomb Israel? Whereas, you know, if you watch your show, you know, you're going to hear substance and you're going to hear facts and and straight talk. So I, I just wanted, you know, he, so he sort of took my question. No, but yeah, it's, so you know, I, I don't know, I don't know that much about what CNN does just because I don't watch them. Um, <laughs> and I know a little bit about what Fox News does because I know people who work there and I know what is going on in their show. So I know mostly about what we are doing. The sort of unofficial motto that we have on my show, like our internal mission statement, is uh, to increase the amount of useful information in the world. So we're trying to do that. And so I see most of what we are doing as explanatory. So here's something going on in the world, whether or not you've heard about it. Here's what are the basics. Here's what I think is important about it. Here's something hilarious that a dumb person said about it. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and now let's talk to an informed person. What do you have to add to the discussion? That's kind of our basic formula. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, the, I mean, I will say that the, one of the things that 
Um, actually, the people, who, people who have criticized this book, one of the criticisms they have, is another one of the criticisms that I sometimes get, particularly from people on the left of my show, the thing that they do not like is the snark, is the humor and the making fun and the skits. And the, that's the best part. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, my attitude toward that stuff, which I think is, I think you get actually a lot more of that on MSNBC um, than you do on other networks, and you certainly get a lot more of it on my show than you do. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's more, I mean, it's, it's so much more discussion. It's much more roundtable. You know, you got Chris, you know, Chris Hayes and Alex. Yeah. They do all those shows where they have multiple people on at the same time, and Fox has that same thing. But, I mean, it's people completely talking about just yeah. outrageous facts instead of uh, outrageous things instead of the facts at hand. Yeah. Plus goofy stuff. But yeah. And, and the, the dork factor is high at MSNBC. <laughs> we are sort of a self-effacing, dorky bunch of weird-looking, nerdy people. And I'm into that. And I, so I do, my feeling about it is that you can talk, A, the American people who are willing to watch cable news can absorb any level of complexity as long as you are very good at telling the story, as long as you are very good at explaining whatever it is you want to be explained, and as long as you start at zero. People can understand graduate level discussion of any topic as long as you start at kindergarten. And you bring people up, and has, it's, it's a test of your explanatory skills, how far you can bring people into the discussion. I also feel like, to the extent that you want to talk about stuff that people are inherently resistant toward because we've been taught to believe that it is boring, say, missile defense, <laughs> it is imperative on you to lace your discussion of missile defense with fart jokes and puns, or whatever it's going to take <laughs> to get people along with, to keep people entertained enough so they can understand it. It's a, it's a science of building understanding. Um, and I find it enormously satisfying. So I'm glad that, uh, I'm sorry about losing your job. I'm glad that you did your experiment. I got a job about six months ago. So. Oh, good. I'm glad. Excellent. Thanks. Hey, Rachel. Um, Hi. I, I'm CM. I, I want to begin by saying that I'm a huge fan of yours. The fact that you're here right now in the flesh in front of me, wearing <laughs> the same glasses and everything, is just incredible. Thank you. Um, you're even saying things back. This is not what happens when watch on TV. Um, I wanted to ask you about North Korea. You spoke about um, our nuclear capabilities and pacifism. And um, recently, um, they've, North Korea has made quite a stir in the media. They've, um, they've uh, conducted various nuclear tests. They've ended their armistice. They've threatened preemptive strikes of justice against um, U.S. bases in South Korea, uh, Hawaii, Guam, and even the mainland U.S. So I want to hear what you think about that. Do you think that um, engaging them head on is advisable, or do you think that pacifism in this situation is I wish that I had a like, great prescription about what would work with North Korea, and I don't. I mean, the prescription that I have in the book is about sort of how we should deal with debating national security issues as a country. Um, and I think it ought to be something that's more overtly part of our political process so that national security stuff doesn't just happen on autopilot. We actually are engaged with it. Um, but in terms of North Korea, it's really scary and weird, and it's been scary and weird for a long time. They are coming to the end of their rope in terms of what they can string together economically. They were sort of from Reagan on, they were really able to count on a lot of international aid and attention. Uh, they, China has sort of babied them along for a very long time. They use arms sales. They do um, what else they can, but they are, they are an economic disaster. They're the only country in the world to experience regular famine after having become an industrialized nation. Um, and it's just the desperation of their economic and humanitarian situation is reflected in the weirdness of their politics. So, I mean, I think our greatest hope right now is that China decides to be constructive, even if it's only in their own interest. China doesn't want North Korea to collapse because they don't want millions of North Koreans swarming over the border into China that then China has to deal with. They don't want a total destabilization of that part of the world because they feel like they're the dominant power there and they'd have to clean it up in some way that they don't want to be involved in. So I think the United States is mostly counting on China to become more responsible toward them. But, you know, all the different things that, like Dennis Rodman is not going to work. Um, and threatening them back is not going to work. And Seoul, we have to sort of count on Seoul not being provoked by the stuff that North Korea is doing to provoke them, which is freaking provocative. I mean, North Korea is killing South Korean soldiers. I mean, when they attacked a South Korean vessel, like... 
that's, it's, it's very hard to imagine the restraint that it takes from South Korea. So it's an incredibly difficult situation. It's why I want us to have great diplomats. Um, but I don't think there's a magic bullet there. Um, we're doing stuff right now that's like kind of kind of scary, you know. So the, the 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 library tower at UMass Amherst is um, 28 stories tall. So just for reference, imagine so a building 17 stories tall. That is 17 stories is the wingspan of a B-2 stealth bomber, and we've been flying B-2 stealth bombers over Seoul to show the South Koreans, don't do anything crazy, we got your back. Those, I mean, that's like seeing a city flying above you. It's the, and it looks like a bat wing, right? It's the scare, visually the scariest thing you can possibly imagine. And they fly round trip from Missouri, they drop inert munitions off, off South Korea, and then they fly back so that everybody in North Korea can see it and everybody in South Korea can see it and we're trying to put our nuclear umbrella over them. It's a very scary situation. Sorry, I don't have an answer, but thank you for the question. Thank you. So you have really nice shoes, too. Your sneakers are awesome. Oh, me? Yes. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Lindsay. I'm um, a campus organizer with MassPerg, so I'm really excited oh. to get to canvas you and Susan this <laughs> summer. I really hope you're home and you answer, because it would be like the highlight of my summer. That's but a little creepy, but thank you. <laughs> Um, but so anyways, I'm most interested in how grassroots movements affect policy change. And I, part of my, some of my favorite parts of your show are when you talk about like feminist movements, unions, whatever. And, but obviously it's hard in this case to build a movement around and change decision makers' self-interest when war doesn't feel that personal, it doesn't feel like we have that much control over it. So I'm just interested in what do you think of the power of grassroots movements to bring about the policy solutions that you outline in your book? And if not, what do you think would bring about the policy changes? I will give you a very specific answer. When I was talking about how veterans are articulating this fear of being pitied and fear of, of, fear, fear of being feared, the sense of alienation from civilian populations. Um, the way they are dealing with that is in classic social movement style. They are refusing to be spoken for and they are speaking for themselves. And so IAVA and other veterans groups right now are incredibly important, um, both because they are saying, listen, we are not gonna be defined as Rambo. We are not going to be defined by Hollywood. We are not gonna be defined by the aberrant actions of people who are committing as many aberrant actions as regular citizens, but are defined as speaking for our speaking for us as a class because they're a veteran. We are going to speak for ourselves and define ourselves, articulate our own agenda, and fight for our own rights. And that is awesome. And they're really well organized. And they have a lot of leadership skills that they developed in part in this amazing institution that we have called the United States military. So to see veterans speaking for themselves, number one, it shows us the way forward in terms of how we are going to make right this relationship, this fractured relationship with these people we sent to fight for 12 years when we did nothing. They will lead us toward doing the right thing. But number two, it also gives us as civilians a way to do something rather than just have an emotional relationship to this issue, which is volunteer with veterans groups. Get involved with veterans groups. Go to the, here, and here we have a huge VA medical center in Northampton you can volunteer there. Um, letting people speak for themselves on their own terms is the solution to all forms of human alienation. And when you can privilege that by saying, hey, I wasn't there, but you were, and I wanna support you being able to speak about having been there, you're doing the right work. So, thank you. Thank you okay. for being an organizer. Thank you. Is this the last question? Uh, we got this would be the third of the four you suggested. You all right, so this one and then one more. All right, and then my voice is going to, I'm fighting a little laryngitis, so then I'm going to. You're being very generous, and if you're tired, we'll go with one more. No, two more. All right, go. Good evening. Um, <laughs> having read your book and also Basevich's Washington Rules, kind of comparing the two, it seems like you, you seem to agree on a lot of topics and on a lot of his conclusions. The exception being that he kind of sees what he, what he calls the Washington Rules as an intentional and almost concerted effort to expand the national security apparatus within certain social circles. And I think this was demonstrated well in his book. And it seems like you don't agree with this um, classification of it as 
intentional, rather citing it as kind of an incidental expansion that happened over you know, the last couple decades. The other, um, and I'd like to hear your take on that. And then also, the one deficit in your book that I really um, came up against was a lack of rhetoric about the classification apparatus and the way that actually leads to the expansion of what we consider national security um, issues that are that we are willing to classify to the point where Americans are not allowed to know about them. And then third is the degree to which our military, you talked about how a lot of people in the military want a all-volunteer force and cited the reason for that as a need for professionalism and a need for higher degree analytical skills and the ability to operate very complex equipment. And I actually find it to be kind of the opposite in the fact that by creating an all-volunteer military, we've essentially removed a large portion of the population from incentive to join. And as a result, a lot of the most intelligent people in our population, the kind of students that attend Amherst College, wouldn't really ever consider joining the military. And so we lose out on a lot of the intellect and a lot of the brightest young people in our nation and their willingness to actually participate in the military. Okay, so number one, Andrew Basevich. Um, I'm a great admirer of Professor Basevich, and I've uh, not only read and digested, but um, I think sort of stewed myself in all of his books, including Washington Rules. The reason that I, I think that it is more incidental than conspiratorial is that I think he's right that there are people within what Eisenhower warned about in his farewell speech, right, about in the military industrial complex, who are trying to change Washington so that it suits their interests in a long-term way that, you know, that, that, that lasts longer than governments and all of these things. I just don't think that those people are the decision makers. I think they are there trying to constantly make that happen. I think what has incidentally occurred is that leaders over time in, from different parties facing different national security circumstances have made decisions that have advanced that agenda for them. But it's like, there's a, it's like it's, a, it's a lobby like any other. And they're well integrated into Washington and Washington sometimes does what they want. But that certainly they create pressure. Number two. May I uh, speak to that real quick? I just. Let, uh, what Actually, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> <laughs> On classification, um, secrecy makes for uh, social lubrication. And so you upset people less when they don't know things are happening. Absolutely. Um, and on the issue of who we are attracting into the military, I would take issue with the idea that the best and brightest are not joining the military. Um, the talking to people who have served in these wars um, over the past 12 years, talking to people particularly who have come out and decided to stay active in making sure that civilian military relations make sense and that veterans are taken care of and people who have been willing to talk about their experience are the single most impressive group of Americans I have ever come across in my generation. And it's, I mean, it's, it's I, don't, I, I don't, we may just see that differently, but um, I, I do think that one of the great advantages of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell is that ROTC will likely return to elite universities. And so elite students at elite universities will have that additional exposure to potential military careers. I think that's a positive. Um, but I think the all-volunteer force is something that the military liked, not because they were getting a quality of person of any kind, but because they didn't want to have to deal with people who didn't want to be there. So, thanks. My name is Theo. Um, I'm a sophomore here, and I have two questions. One, can you please sign this? I'm a real big fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, totally well. Michael, do you have a pen? Huh? Yes, oh, I have right. a pen. Yeah, I'll do it. Um, and the second question, which is, a little more related. Um, so um, during this election cycle, I kind of followed you. I followed your newscast, and I noticed that you were talking about how there's the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and how even though we're in one of the longest wars of like like our history, we don't actually talk about foreign policy. Like that was the one thing that didn't actually come up in like the debates. It was right. just kind of washed over. And I'm wondering what is what's your take on it? That there was basically one side of the. Um, I guess the political debate that only had like had a advanced a different kind of foreign policy and the other side that really didn't have one. It means that the Democrats get off scot-free because they have no competition. I mean really, watching Paul Ryan trying to answer questions about foreign policy 
It was like watching a dog trying to speak. Like, you can do so much. You have so many skills. It's like, not that he's, he's not, I'm not trying to say he's canine in any way. I was trying to say like, this is, he's not actually. If you had to pick like his spirit animal, it would not be a dog, right? It would be. But like, it's kind of like, use your words. Like they're trying to, they're trying to create the impression that they have ideas about foreign policy. And there's a reason that Joe Biden was laughing throughout the vice presidential debate. <laughs> it's not his thing. It's also not Mitt Romney's thing. It's not the Republican Party's thing. And that has left in place, and going back to the whole point of this discussion, that has left in place the fact that there aren't any new Republican ideas or any rising stars on foreign policy have left in place the George W. Bush era Republicans. That's who's still in charge in that party on foreign policy. The only two, we had the main foreign policy speech at the 2012 Republican convention was Condoleezza Rice. The other one was John McCain. The, senior, the, the foreign policy advisors to the Romney campaign, there were 24 of them, 17 of them were George W. Bush era officials. They have not evolved since then. And they think that if you were like a Wolfowitz guy, if you were a Iraq war architect guy, that counts as foreign policy expertise in the Republican Party. And that is a catastrophe for our country. Not only because we do need Republicans to get their act together on this subject, in part because they control the House, but also because the Democrats need a good debating partner. The best policies come from the best fights. And if one side of the fight is essentially defaulting, they're forfeiting, they can barely even participate in the conversation, then what wins that argument will not be as strong as if there was a real debate going on there. The Republicans can't even put that fight up right now and that's bad for the country. So I, I hope that they can cultivate talent there. I don't know where it's gonna come from. We haven't seen it yet, um, but I hope they get there. And I will sign your thing, thank you. <laughs>